Yeah, and I think fear of failure as well as much it's going to be much more damaging than try, try something I think um, you know you generally only regret stuff that you didn't do as opposed to stuff that you tried and maybe failed at and so I think that's something we've definitely learned and you know we're much bolder in our decisions and confident that you know if something does go wrong it's not the end of the world we've got a good foundation we've got a good product and we've had some amazing feedback and we know people like it so that gives us confidence to kind of go forward and not be too scared to make, make the occasional mistake, basically. Hello and welcome back to Breaking Bread, the food podcast presented by Food Obsessed Friends, Carl and Liam. I am your host, Liam, and I welcome you to this episode with Catherine and Harry from Burning Barn Rum. Hope you all are well. What have you all been eating lately? Why not go over to Instagram and tag us in some of your delicious photos of food. We'd love to see pictures of food. Never get tired of seeing them. Obviously, give us a little follow and have a little look at our pictures as well. Just search for Breaking Bread Podcast UK in Instagram. You'll find us there. Thank you to everyone who listened to our last episode with one of Brum's best bloggers, Laura from Bite Your Brum. Huge thank you to everyone who took the time to just send us a little message. It means so much to us to hear your feedback like that. I'm really glad you all enjoyed it because I loved uh, recording it. It was class. We we always love hearing from you. And if you do enjoy what we do in general, why not give us a little hand by heading over to your podcast app and rating and reviewing us. It makes a massive difference and gets us heard by more people. So today's episode is with Burning Barn Run. If you enjoy this episode, why not go back and have a little listen of our episode with Crazy Gin. We had a great little chat with their owners as well. It's quite a similar thing, so if you enjoy this, you might enjoy that kind of thing. We recorded this episode in an old shepherd's hut, which was renovated by Harry himself. Such a cool space. He does such a brilliant job. A little wood burner. I still put all the little photos up and stuff. We had such a lovely day down at the farm near Sully Hall. We got a nice little guided tour. It was lovely, yeah. We had an awesome chat with Harry and Catherine. We heard where the inspiration come from for the rum. And was given a real insight into what it's like to start your own business from scratch. I really enjoyed the chat and... There's quite a lot of useful information there if maybe you're looking to do something similar. They actually have an offer on for you, lucky listeners, right now. If you head to their website, I'll put the link in the show notes and enter the code BARN15, that's B-A-R-N 15, to get 15% off a bottle of their rum. Don't forget to head over to our website while you're on there. Have a look at our full show notes. If you go to our website, it's breakingbreadpodcastuk.blog. You can see all the show notes from every episode. There's a few little food blogs on there. Not as many as I'd like to write, but everything's a bit time-consuming at the moment. The podcast's taking a lot of the time, so not much writing. But there's a few little ones on there. There's Poli and the Birmingham Food Tour. I've a little review of that. So if you want to go and check that out, obviously we'll put the show notes on there are a lot bigger than the ones that we can fit on the podcast. So we put a lot more pictures up and just a little bit of extra extra info on there so go check that out yeah so that's enough for me anyway so ladies and gentlemen burning barn run hello harry and hello Catherine. welcome to breaking bread podcast hi thanks for having us thanks hello for- <laughs> sorry i did just straight away spoke over you like we just said we wasn't gonna do <laughs> thank you very much for inviting you down to your amazing farm and what a day for it yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Seeing it, seeing it as best light. <laughs> Good day for it. So, do you want to just tell us a little bit about why we're here today? Obviously, we've got the rum. You're from Burning Barn Rum. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, we're we co-founded Burning Barn Rum in 2017. Um, so, we're married, and the farm that we're at now is Harry's family farm where Harry grew up. Um, so, maybe Harry wants to tell us about the history of the farm. 
Um, yeah, so originally um, we're a fruit farm, and we still are in many respects. Um, growing apples, strawberries, raspberries, lots of soft fruit and stuff um, for a thing that was quite common. You still see it occasionally, but um, it was a, mainly a pick-your-own farm, so we'd have people uh, over to the farm and, uh, and they'd pick fruit and stuff. And gradually we sort of diversified away from that for various reasons. Um, and so my dad... Uh, has a business making toffee apples, amongst other things. How did he get into toffee apples? Um, I don't really know. So I think we've got all the infrastructure here for sort of fruit growing. So that involves having a packing house where once you've picked the fruit, um, you go and pack it and send it away to kind of um, wholesalers or, or whatever. And then there was once there was, there was a big decline in, in Pick Your Own, in the 90s due to Sunday opening hours um, and things like foot and mouth. Um, and I think dad was approached by somebody who, somebody else who was making toffee apples who needed needed some help scaling their production up. We had, um, you know, a packing house and we had a workforce. And so it was just one of those serendipitous things that it just happened. You know, it was just an opportunity that, that, that came to us really, I think. And, um, and then dad is he's basically like a, a British Willy Wonka and <laughs> and he invented you know with with some friends it, you know he invented a toffee apple machine where you stick a to- an apple in one end and uh, you get a toffee apple out the other end and uh, sort of ended up actually sort of taking over the the business from the guy who uh, who who had originally asked him to to help make it up so and and we're here today. We're sort of making a few million toffee apples this season. So, wow. yeah. Have you ever put anything else in the machine? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we've it's um, we've tried all different fruits. <laughs> like everything. Yeah, but it, there's something specific about an apple. I think it's the thickness of the skin. So obviously, you're putting it into sugar, which is like really hot. Malt. You know, sort of 170 degrees or something. And everything out, apart from an apple, maybe a potato would work, but I'm not sure you'd want to eat it. <laughs> no. So you have, you've got the uh, toffee apples. So where did the whole rum sort of thing come from? I, I know. I just want to ask something while we're still on messing about with toffee apples. Would you ever do a collab? Oh yeah, we've we. I mean, I think I think a lot of people have said like toffee yeah, apple rum would would be good. Top, yeah. yeah, and there's definitely. Uh, I think it's really cool when you do the short run limited edition stuff yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. so it's it's certainly something we've thought it's about yeah yeah so i was just thinking about like honey rum the honey rum in the toffee apple yeah 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 or yeah <laughs> toffee, toffee apple flavored rum is definitely yeah. a, definitely a potential goer oh yeah yeah, yeah i never even thought about it the other way around yeah, yeah of course yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um but yeah C- uh, catherine could probably tell you about the the story of, of the rum because it's her sort of bag really well it's actually Harry's idea, to be honest. Like the, the full idea for doing a rum and doing it here and doing the flavours that we've done was Harry's idea. I guess it started with the fire. So in 2015, that barn over there burnt down completely. Um, so it was just one of the mornings, about this time of year actually, when they were setting up to make the toffee apples that day and there was a fluke accident and like something happened with the toffee boiler and it you know, malfunctioned, set fire. And the whole barn burnt down that day. Um, and I don't know if you've heard any planes today, but we're right under the flight path. So the flights were actually diverted into the airport because there was a huge column of black smoke. I mean, we can show you the video. It was like insane. Um, so, you know, that was quite a disastrous scenario. And Simon, having had built the whole business up and built the machines and everything, sort of his life's work was essentially up in flames. So I think that was really, a, you know, it's his response to that and, the fact that he then rebuilt the business, rebuilt the barn and kept going, even when he, you know, he's in the 60s, he could have easily just moved on and thought, you know, my time's up kind of thing. That was so inspiring to us. And we, we'd always talked about starting a business. I've always wanted to do food and drink business specifically. And it, I think that was really the start of us thinking more seriously about it and thinking if he can do it, then, you know, we should, we should give it a go. Yeah. And, and beforehand, we'd been thinking about distilling as well, because... We have a little bit of of waste from the toffee apple business where we've got um, apples that, you know, are overripe or, you know, a little bit of wastage from the production. And so I was thinking initially, how, how can we how can we 
as opposed to what we do now, which is we just compost it and, and then turn it into a sort of fertilizer, which we spread on the fields. You know, is there a way that we could kind of use these apples and sugar in a better way? So I was thinking, well, you could, if you add yeast, you're essentially going to be able to distill it. And so I was actually originally thinking about distilling with an eye to making bioethanol, so fuel, um, which potentially could then go to, you know, to run the, the energy for the factory or whatever. But the kind of fire and the imagery of the fire and the sugar and stuff like that, it was almost a bit of a light bulb moment in terms of like, oh, I know we should do more with this. And then when we looked into the growth of craft distilling, the growth of craft spirits and craft beer in the UK, we're like, this seems like a massive opportunity. And then, but we don't drink gin and we didn't want to make beer. So we're like, well, we know we, we like rum. So we looked into the rum market and were amazed to discover that rum and gin have almost the same market share. But then you look at gin and the offering that you get, if you go into a pub with craft gin, you've got hundreds of different locally sourced, amazing craft gins that are made by real people with real ingredients. And then you look at the, the rum options and it's maybe a few brands and certainly in the flavoured sector where you've got you've probably got three brands you're gonna and then mass produced industrially flavored products so you know it was like one of those we couldn't sleep kind of thinking about right we've got to do this got to do this and we just sort of jumped in with both feet so there was kind of a combination of of things that all came together you know and if you think about it it's sort of we had loads of sugar on the farm for for making toffee apples and it was just a natural progression into rum as, as opposed to gin it just seemed like a bunch you know a great fit and it's sort of worked out quite well since then that's great so you must have been thinking at first how we're we going to put these apples into the rum yeah no def- i mean that was definitely sort of it it was kind of it was it was definitely motivated by you know how do we, how do we best use the resources that we've got around us and that's definitely continued into the flavors that we've got. So we smoke the rum with our, with apple wood from our apple trees. We sp- roast all the spices by hand on site for our spice drum. And then for our honey rum, we, we use, you know, some of our own honey from our own beehives uh, for that. So yeah, it was definitely all kind of inspired by the stuff that was around us, you know, and that we, we knew about basically. Yeah. Cause we just did a taste of them. They're all fantastic. Was the smoked one, because obviously you can get honey rums. You see them abroad and yeah. spiced rums you can see. You don't see many smoked rums. So was no. that just the idea from seeing the barn burn or did something else come into play for that? Yeah, it was pretty much the combination of that and a love of smoked flavours um, and anything smoked really. Um, and there was a point, it was when we were living in Bristol actually. So we hadn't got married long before. Harry had been away with his job and then he had a bit of time off and I would be at work all day, come back and the kitchen would be either full of smoke or full of spice flavors because he'd been testing out the recipes all day. They had all these little jars lined up with like spiced version one, two, three, a three B and smoked and everything. And he'd be, you know, get me to taste them. And he tried all the different woods that you can get, um, for like a cocktail smoker. So what was it? Maple and hickory and oak and stuff like that. And they're all good. Cause it's, you know, it's still a, a really good rum and a, and a nice smoke flavor but when we tried the apple wood it was just the it just made so much sense because we've got the apple wood here and it actually tasted the best as well it just works really well with the rum base you can get a little bit of the apple flavor coming through and it's just yeah it was a match made in heaven basically so then that sort of became our hero product of you know this is really what we're bringing as an innovation the spiced is our version of a category that already exists we want to try and improve that but the smoked is something new that we can bring and that's really directly inspired by our story. You say you wanted to improve spiced rum, but um, why did you want to improve it? What's wrong with the ones that are out there? So it wasn't, re- it wasn't that there was anything wrong with them. It was yeah. that we felt that there was an opportunity to have a different bit, uh, take on, on the category. So from our experience, most of the ones that are, are sort of mass, you know, generally available are quite sweet and quite vanilla heavy or they're using sort of Christmassy spices like cloves and cinnamon. So we kind of wanted to make something that was hot, you know, quite actually spicy, yeah. <laughs> which I think we've achieved. <laughs> How did you find it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I thought yeah, it was, definitely got the spice off. You get the ginger and the chili through it, definitely. 
Yeah, and I, th- I think the other thing that sort of um, motivated the Spiced was um, that currently they're mostly quite sweet and they get lost with the mixer, whereas ours, ours is kind of quite punchy. It's got really, really bold, um, bold flavours with this sort of ginger, chilli, allspice, um, but with still that like that rounded element with the coconut and the vanilla. So we wanted it to come through a mixer as well. So um, I guess it's just kind of something that was providing a genuine sort of craft option with with some, a really cool story behind it to people who wanted a little bit more out of their spice drums, basically. I think that's kind of what we were going, th- going for. So how long did it take you to get from nothing to a stage where you had a smoke drum that you were happy with? So the smoke drum didn't take too long um, in terms of getting the flavour or deciding on the wood to smoke it. Because, it, like Catherine said, I don't know whether it was like cognitive bias or something where we just, it, it's something clicked in our psychology where we're like, well, it's our tree, so it's better. <laughs> or whether it is actually objectively better. But, you know, in all of the blind tests, the apple wood from our own trees was just miles better than any of the uh, the wood chips we got in. Who did, who did you do the blind test? We were just... Our oh, friends, family. Uh, everyone in. Um, yeah. I mean, we, yeah, we got pretty heavily, inv- heavily involved as well, yeah. Um, <laughs> remarkable how your alcohol tolerance goes up when you're sort of like professionally obliged to, to, <laughs> to do it. Um, but yeah, with the smoked one, it didn't, it didn't take too long to get that, that profile but just because the apple would just was so much... There was so, you know, in the, in the pros column, it was just like miles ahead of everything else. Um, it was more the level of smoke, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was actually the pr- it was actually the process of how how you infuse it and get it right without over smoking it, with making sure that you had the right, you know, not the not the bad elements of the smoke going in, and and actually, if you get it wrong, you know, there's potential to ruin quite a lot of good good rum if you over if you overdo it or or get it wrong. Um, so that was that was the real difficulty with the smoked, yeah. I don't know if you could or have you tried or would you be tempted to like maybe let us smoke drum maybe could you smoke it in like ex whiskey barrels or something you know smoky whiskey barrels yeah I think I think as we sort of as we go on I think we really want to sort of um, experiment experiment, yeah and sort of major on like limited edition short run things um, for our you know loyal customers who who are really really into it and want to want to see different sort of flavor and different pr- different sort of innovations in that in that sort of area yeah yeah i think they go well my first thoughts when i smelled the smoke room is like if if you like a good real good smoked whiskey yeah. you would absolutely love the smoke room it's the same kind of family i feel like you know yeah yeah but it, who's gonna want it and then I was thinking you could use it in maybe a, a few cocktails that you could use whiskey and you could use the smoked rum in. Oh, absolutely. It's it's definitely, I think the people who like it are those who, who like quite a peaty sort of West Coast, West Coast whiskey. I don't think we'd ever try and say it would replace, you know, malt whiskey or something. But if you like whiskey and you like rum, you know, our smoked rum is definitely a good place to start, I think. Yeah. So how have you managed to get it? to market basically i know you can get it on your website but how are you getting on with getting into shops or getting into businesses and bars and stuff like that so it's sort of been trial and error to be perfectly honest um my background was in retail so that was where we naturally started you know going into farm shops and bottle shops and independents and local places um where it was really well received because they generally did already have a big range of gin and not much rum so they kind of wanted that they oh great this is another you know, where we can expand our spirits offering with something local. And then we've just tried other routes to market, basically trade shows, um, using wholesalers, um, trying to get into the on-trade now in bars and restaurants and things like that and pubs and, um, yeah, just winging it, basically. <laughs> I think we were quite naive about it at the start um, and really ambitious as well. So, you know, we just, we're just like, well, we want to be in these places and we think we're we're providing a solution to what a lot of people we knew there's loads of rum drinkers out there we know there's a limited offering and we know that people really value like the craft sort of ethic of having stuff that's made by real people with authentic ingredients so that sort of gave us the confidence whether it was sort of founded or not to just approach people that you know like um harrods and um harvey nichols and 
and amazingly they sort of really like the product well not amazingly because it's amazing <laughs> but <laughs> but for a tiny little startup for them to go yeah you know send us some cases and then to see it in those places what was amazing and it really just gave us the confidence just to, to go on and now we're you know, we sh- you should be able to find us in lots of places now, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, so much so of your intention for each rum, like how would you expect them to each flavour to be sort of drank or consumed? So, so as Catherine said, our smoked rum is kind of, is our hero product. It represents everything that we want, you know, Burning Barn to be. It's got a direct sort of line from the fire. The, the flavour and the inspiration come from that with the smoke um, and the ingredients come from, you know, meters away from where we make it with the uh with the applewood chips that we use from our orchard and so with that one you know we'd we we'd rec- we envisage that being drunk as a sipping rum on its own with a bit of ice or you know in an old-fashioned with a bit of a bit of you know a sweet element a simple syrup your favorite bitters a big chunk of ice and some pink grapefruit peel you know that's the smoke rum just stands out on its own but also in any other sort of drink that you want that smoky element like you said any any whiskey cocktail you could substitute it but then also something like a a bloody mary is incredible with that smoky element like you know get that umami with the tomato and the spices it's work it works really well and we do have like a sort of simple serve for them all as well because we recognize you know not everyone's going to be whapping out the cocktail shakers and mixing it up every time they want to drink it. So we pair the smoked with ginger ale in a tall glass with lime. And that's a really good take on, on the drink. It's just, you know, it just tastes amazing with the extra addition of the smoke. Like it works really well with the ginger. Um, for the honey, we use lemonade, like a sort of Sicilian lemonade, more like a homemade type of lemonade. Because that, again, there's sort of slight bitterness from the lemon and then the honey sweetness. And for spice, just a good cola because we know that people love spice and coke and ours is just that difference on the category you know that the spiciness and yeah just adds a bit of an extra element to there well, yeah the sweetness just adds to the to the spices harry just said then about the the smoked rum being the kind of whole beating heart of burning barn rum you know with the story of the old barn and the bottles like as soon as we've seen the bottles, we're both commenting on how nice the bot- bottles are. Is there a story about how you managed to come up with the branding and the bottles? And yeah, well, Thank <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, we love them. Um, well, we wanted we wanted it to be recognisable as a rum, so we wanted it to. So it's it's got like a hook on it, you know, um, like a, that classic rum bottle shape. But then we wanted to have that sort of premium element to it as well. So it's got that really heavy, heavy base. So that was, we, we, you know, spent hours and hours looking for it. And it was, it was a bit like the sort of, you know, light bulb moment with the smokes. As soon as we saw that bottle, we knew we had to have that for, for our rum. And then in terms of the design, we just wanted the, our story to be immediately recognizable. And so the image on it is, is a barn with flames um, in, in sort of bright gold and bronze foil on on the various things so but uh, when we started this whole journey we knew that design and and uh and gra- graphic design and stuff like that wasn't really our forte so um yeah we worked with a, a design company down in in bristol called green chameleon who just came out with some amazing amazing uh designs that just worked perfectly with our with our brand and what what we'd envisaged in the first place yeah it's translated the vision to the bottle (laughs) and yeah we've been so happy with it and it's been really important to us as well to have so all of our ingredients are all natural and we don't use additives so same with the bottle we wanted to have no plastic so we've got the natural cork tops and wood and then the paper's actually recycled paper that we use so that was really important and it adds to the feel and look of the bottle as well like the nice sort of texture of the paper you said design wasn't your forte and you kind of understood that from the beginning. Was there like an honest conversation where you both sat down and said, we're both not the best at this kind of thing. We'll get, like, how did you have the maturity to say, oh, we'll get somebody in to help us do that? Because it's a, it's a place where most startups kind of fail. They don't realise they do have weaknesses. Like, you've got to be honest and say, yeah, we have weaknesses. So we'll just go out and look for someone to come in and do that for us. It's tempting when you're a startup to try and do it all yourself. 
did you have like an honest conversation or yeah i just think we we just really knew the, the importance of getting it right um because i think obviously the liquid's got is the most important thing it's got to taste amazing but nobody's going to try it if they don't they're not drawn to it on the shelf and they don't like the look of it and they don't get the story from it or the brand or any sort of messaging from it so yeah that was really where we realized how important it was and we wanted to get it right first time basically yeah it wasn't a difficult conversation i don't yeah. think i think if if it was down to us it would look like johnny age five on the front <laughs> of the bottle um and like Catherine said you know for us as a tiny little startup when, when we were beginning we knew that we just had to get onto the shelf and then it was down to the consumer and you've got all of this um, these amazing brands these amazing you know bottles and a huge part of of people buying spirits is they want to treat themselves they want us to have something nice on on their back bar or in their spirit shelf and we knew that if we were going to go up and be on those shelves next to those big names that we had to compete in the way we looked um and so yeah it wasn't difficult for the conversation we we knew we had to you know go to the best people to try and make sure that we were doing uh justice to the liquid in the bottle with with how it was represented and and we think we've done that we, we absolutely love the uh the bottle and, and and how it looks and i think it's a pretty good representation of what what you get for for it as well yeah but i mean i believe your whole branding from start to finish social media everything you can see it all the way through and i think that's brilliant did, did you have any uh mentors or anyone who can you call up and get a hand you know someone you need for advice or anyone like that well, Harry's dad was probably the first mentor just because he's, you know, so close to the fam- us and the family and with his history of building up a business himself, that was invaluable advice. Um, I also joined the NatWest program, which is an accelerator hub in, in Birmingham, and that's been incredible. Um, Can anyone join that? Do you know much about it? Or? Yeah, you, ju- you just apply every, every six months you can apply. Um, so if you're, yeah, if you're, if you're a founder or a co-founder of a business, you can apply. Um yeah. And they sort of take an intake, I think it's about 80 businesses every six months. And they're based at Brindley Place and you can have office space there as well. So for me, because, you know, we're sort of rural here, um, you know, there wasn't a huge support network, although we had Simon. It's been amazing to have those other entrepreneurs that I can sort of bounce stuff off and ask questions of and, you know, just have that support network there. Um, And yeah, that's definitely provided a sort of mentorship. Is there anything that really hasn't gone to plan? Have you had any big challenges or anything? We've made a lot of mistakes, that's for sure. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a massive learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's okay making mistakes as long as you learn from them. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, I mean, from what Harry said earlier, you know, from the naivety of thinking, oh, if it's good, then, you know, people will buy it kind of thing. Everyone makes that mistake. Yeah. Yeah, through to, you know, just suppliers letting us down, um, you know, things breaking when we're trying to make a batch, you know, just the weather. The weather. Yeah, we had one day, we, we, it was last Christmas when we had all that snow and we planned to do a batch at the weekend and we literally had, you know, a, fo- a foot of snow. Harry's trying to drive the tractor. It's like skidding around, trying to pick up the barrels of rum. Like, it's just, And then your hang, hands almost freezing to the bottles, trying to label them. It was just, so yeah we've definitely had our challenges but um yeah absolutely learned from them all and kind of trying to learn and grow all the time so you talk about the growth what's happening in regards to growth how are you going to grow the business from here well we've grown this year with the addition of the honey rum so that's kind of added the to the range and we've now got a gift pack as well for christmas so that's got a little miniature of each in a little box which will hopefully do well for christmas um, a year after we launched, we launched our own e-commerce website. So we didn't initially have that. And we're now, you know, having a real push to try and get into other cities because we've got quite good presence in Birmingham and this local area. So now we want to expand out to the rest of the UK, Manchester, London, Brighton, maybe into a bit of Scotland, back to my hometown and <laughs> sell it there. Yeah, I, th- I think as Catherine said earlier, our sort of initial focus was was on retail because that's, that's the area we were most comfortable with. And yeah, through sort of working more in Brum and, and places like that, we've we've definitely focused a lot more on the on the bar trade, pub and bar trade, and and actually, you know, um, working with partners to get our rums on on bars as well as in shops and stuff like that. So that's mm-hmm. been a yeah, that's been a big cool. aspect of the growth, and yeah. it's a, it's it's such a great thing to see people drinking it in that environment. 
Um, you know, people really like, you know, free time is such a scarce resource now. And people, I think people really value going out to pubs and, and bars and stuff, especially in Birmingham. And, uh, and it's just awesome to see, you know, our, our products, you know, behind those kind of things. Mm. Um, and we've definitely grown in that area with sort of cocktail competitions and things like that. And yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah, we did an awesome cocktail competition last month, actually, at the Vanguard in the Jewelry Quarter. Oh, great place. Yeah, really cool place. Um, yeah, Sam's a total legend for letting us just use the bar and <laughs> take over. But yeah, we had um, seven bartenders sort of fighting it out. And then the winner, she came here with Sam and Luke from the Vanguard and had like a day of, you know, having a look at what we do and stuff. So yeah, we definitely like to do more of that. And we're looking to export as well. So we already export to Germany, but we'd love to do other European countries and be able to drink a rum when we go on holiday, basically. <laughs> yeah, they drink a lot of honey rum in Spain, so I can yeah. definitely see that there. You're right, yeah, we've already had a little bit of interest from Spain on that, so yeah, that's definitely a, a target for us. Just want to talk a little bit about competition. What rums do you like to drink? So I, th- I think for me, um, there's some great um, other small British sort of craft rums. Um, Is there many out there? No? There aren't many, um, but there's definitely been other people that have sort of seen the opportunity that we've seen as well. Yeah, there's been more since we started. Yeah, yeah and and that have sort of come up and uh, and are doing really cool things as well. So um, there's a little Scottish rum distillery called Ninefold who are making a white rum. Um, there's Drum uh, and Black. Drum and Black who make a, a really cool spiced rum. And uh, is it the Cornish Distilling Company? Yeah. Um, who are also doing really cool things down in, in Cornwall. So... It's one of those things that we don't really look at it as competition. It's one of those things yeah. that I think um, I heard a good phrase that you know all boats rise on a on a rising tide. So it's I was just about to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just think it just shows that there's the, that demand there, and um, I don't think it's about competition. I think it's about just providing something different and original. I think we're we're all doing that. There's some really really good producers out there, mm. but then obviously you know you've got the that those amazing. Um, Caribbean rums like you know Foursquare and people like that who who make some great rums as well so mm. yeah a bit of everything white rums something you don't see a lot of why would that be what's the difference between white and dark rum what is there something they do differently well I think traditionally white rums always had a bit of a bad reputation Bacardi exactly yeah, that's yeah. the only one everyone yeah. knows and everyone tries it and everyone gets sick and it's often it's often much stronger and because you're disti- you know rum is essentially distilled from sugar sugar cane you get very very high alcohol content which can be quite harsh and so you know you've got sort of white rums you've got dark rums you've got golden rums and it's not as strict a category as whiskey where you know it has to be matured for three years in you know wooden casks so there's lots of variation in the rum category but i think in general white rum's got a bad reputation because it's often been mass produced and it's really high high strength quite cheap quite cheap just using cocktails basically yeah so people don't actually drink it on its own or sort of even really know what it's like on its own but it's hilarious how many people we meet who've had a terrible experience with rum <laughs> you know when they've been younger it's one of the first things they've drunk and they're just oh no i just can't touch it <laughs> everyone's mum and dad has an old bottle of bacardi and exactly it, so yeah when they're not there, it's the first one you grab all of yeah but i think it's like tequila in in the way brits all look at well a lot of a lot of british people look at tequila badly because you've been drinking really really bad tequila mm. because you're not in mexico drinking this and the amazing sort of reposados and like aged tequilas that are made you know in the same way as if you went to an amazing distillery in scotland you drink really nice whiskey but i bet back in the day if you were in africa or south america people didn't like whiskey because they were getting really cheap whiskey do you see what i mean so yeah. this think people have been drinking bad examples of spirits and i think that's improving now with kind of you know the the more the better availability of sort of smaller craft craft brands and stuff so you can get some really really amazing white rums that work in cocktails and and have that complexity and variation that you see from you see them from other, other categories and stuff yeah, like that, that amazing distillery in Washington, yeah so we did a did a sort of managed to sort of cram in a bit of a, a business trip to to america which has got an amazing craft distilling scene business trip <laughs> yeah biz, business trip exactly um and there's some there's some amazing little distilleries making 
some uh, some really great spirits over there and i visited a uh a distillery called cotton and reed in washington who, which is just a pure rum distillery and it's kind of it's really inspirational actually it's kind of seeing our vision for a couple of years over there already happening kind of thing so um yeah there's there's lots of opportunities and and sort of going back to what i was originally saying i think quite often these bad experiences just come from the fact that you've been drinking a bad example of something probably in huge excess <laughs> like, you know with with tango or something or you know it's probably it's probably not the best way to to enjoy spirits you know, you'll be telling us some book is misunderstood next and that, that I don't believe that for a second. Oh, no, I would not be in any, adv- any way an advocate of some book. <laughs> would you have any Horrendous. plans to diversify and maybe do uh, like a white rum or anything? We've definitely thought about it. Yeah, I mean, one of our, you've, you've seen our experimental still when we did a little tour earlier. That's definitely something we want to give a give a go, ha- you know, have a go at doing is um, distilling a UK based rum thinking about doing a white rum and then potentially aging that and um, harry's the ops director so he can probably <laughs> yeah i think i think with the white rum it's it's not as popular in terms of people aren't buying bottles of white rum so much but you know rum's the most used spirits in co- in, in cocktails and, and white rum is, is part of that cocktail scene and in terms of you know credibility as a brand you know we, we want to engage with bartenders a lot and just see what they they're asking for and ultimately it's all about it's all about the demand and what people want. Um, and there's been a bit of a mixed response when it comes to white rum, actually. Mm. Um, so because it is a house pour, so it's kind of, because it's used in so many cocktails, people don't necessarily appreciate how much better it can be if it's a good white rum, if you see what I mean. They're just it's happy to... It's than if you want to come in with a craft rum and charge a little bit more. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's the point. And, and for us, at this sort of point in the, in our sort of growth, we're we've got to be quite careful about what we choose and what we want to do is is concentrate all of our efforts on a on a few things so we can absolutely nail those um and so it's it's quite a big decision about what we sort of move on to mm-hmm. i think we definitely want to make a, a a super premium aged aged rum um but yeah we've got to we've got to think carefully and talk to a lot of people and and see what people want in terms of whether we do a right white rum, whether we continue doing more uh, flavored rums or or shorter edition kind of kind of things, but uh, that's the next step, really. I think. Do you have any employees? I've just had two interns from UOB over the summer, and they were amazing. So shout out to Emily and Chris. <laughs> that's good. I thought you were going to um, say they were just awful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right off employed anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> No, we've actually kept them on, both of them on. So um, oh, brilliant. not full time because they're, you know, going on to their full time jobs or continuing to study. But yeah, um, that's definitely in the plans to sort of bulk up the staff because I'm currently doing. Yeah, we get people in, obviously, when we're doing production. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's still quite a, a small team. <laughs> you look after everything from social media. You do social media yourself. I think Catherine... Yeah. I have been doing it until I had my intern who Emily who's now gonna that she's that's what she's gonna carry on to that's do because um doing. yeah she's great at that so um People yeah, don't realize how time that exactly yeah it it really you know even just thinking oh I'll just post you know a couple of times a week but yeah you really have to plan it and create the content you guys know as well because you're you're you, do, you get, create great content so it does take up a lot of time yeah <laughs> got severely underestimated when we started yeah it was just social media i thought i'd be all right we just post the way it'd be easy and i've never done it before really i never had my own i had my own instant but not facebook or anything yeah so yeah it's, it's just something that takes so much time and it is you can't help but think i could be doing something so much better this time <laughs> i know but it's all part of building the brand isn't it you've got to engage people yeah. on, that, on those platforms so um yeah we've done quite a lot more videos recently so we're doing a video of the shepherd's hat build that we're in now and cocktail videos and things like that because i think that's a great way for, to show people you know a bit more behind the scenes and what we're up to and stuff did you both always know you wanted your own business like was it something obviously with your family having their own farm and running their own business harry yeah it must be always a been deep down in you like i need to have my own business yeah did you I, work for something we never even asked did you work for somebody before or? so I'm, I'm actually a soldier so i'm i'm in the army so oh, catherine oh, still in the army yeah yeah oh, so right. catherine's the you know the, the main sort of it's, it's her business really i just sort of help out with the production side um when i get a bit of time off 
So I felt like I, I always wanted to do that. And I, I think I always wanted to do something, you know, like being in the army or the police or in the fire service. I always felt a real strong sort of sense of, um, you know, that that was something that, that I wanted to do. But in terms of in terms of business and in terms of working outside of that kind of area, uh, I think I'm very much my father's son in, in that regard. And, and he's always said that the only reason he's doing this is because he couldn't work for someone else or nobody else would employ him. And I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably definitely in the same bracket. Um, yeah, I think uh, sort of maybe, maybe longer term, I, I definitely envisage myself uh, working, working for myself in whatever capacity. And, and this, is, this is a great start. Surely, sorry, surely it's two opposite extremes. Like you've got the army where you're told what to do all the time and then you're an entrepreneur or a startup where you get to do what you want. <laughs> well, I, th- I think... Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the army's amazing and, and I love it and uh and it's been a it's been a great experience in terms of, you know, doing something meaningful with my life, but the bit that's missing for me occasionally is the creative ele- element and I love cooking and I I love making stuff. And so this is a great outlet for that. So, you know, I can't come home on the weekends or when I've got a bit of time off and and it doesn't even feel like a job to me and I guess that's just cuz I'm doing it just only at those times i'm sure it feels like a job for Catherine sometimes does it well I, I feel so lucky to be able to do it and it's it's been an amazing transformation from being in an office and that sort of thing and i wouldn't change it but there are there are times when you just think oh it was easier when i just had a paycheck and i just could like go home on a friday and you know forget about it and go back in on monday so there's that little, little element of that but generally it's it's been amazing and i've learned like so much more than I ever could have learned even in another 10 years in a job like it's just been a huge yeah and I have always wanted to do it I guess in my head when I was you know 18 19 thinking oh no I have my own business I had assumed I would have you know at least 20 years in in a job or in different jobs learn get learning experience and gaining that experience but I think you get to the point where you realize you can't ever have enough experience to start a business that in, apart from starting a business, there's no other experience for it. So you kind of just have to go really for it. Learn in school either, like the, yeah. Not, not, you can do business studies, but it's not the same as running your own business. Exactly. And you've got until the day before you've started it, you've got no idea what it's, what it's going to be like really. I mean, it's, it's totally different. Um, At what stage did you make the jump then from like full-time employment to burning barn? Well, it's quite funny actually, because we were kind of doing the business plan and we'd sort of got Simon on board and he was happy for us to start up here. And um, we had to apply for HMA licenses from HMRC. So that took quite a long time. Is it easy, hard? Pretty tricky actually, okay. yeah. They, they interview you, they come round, you've got to do business plans and paperwork and it's it's a pretty onerous process. You have to apply process. a solid whole licensing as well. To, uh, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they all come out like? and just loads of paperwork yeah diagrams of where everything's gonna go and you know full detail to, um, crazy gin yeah i keep calling him craziest thing but bruce that's his name bruce and pram yeah he had all kinds of problems with wolverhampton city council you know trying to get their license and he's, he's even having more problems now again now that he's moved oh even, really even though he's only moving like 100 yards or so yeah so it's, it's just, just so much red so tape it's just or... getting I mean, I think they've just got to tick off certain boxes. You've got to satisfy them that you're going to be doing things the right way and you've got, rec- you know, the right processes in place. You're recording everything because for them, it's all about the duty. And, you know, you're bringing in something that's got a duty applied to it and they need to be able to know that you're keeping track of it. So it's, yeah, it's all that really. I think um, it's going to be tricky for anyone um, just because it's that much trickier with alcohol. So, so you were saying then, so you had to apply for licenses and stuff and then you were getting to what? point you decided to make the leap from full-time employment well in, in terms of deciding what that i was going to leave my job um harry had sort of thought, thought this is going to have to happen if we're going to even start this quite a long time before i had i think i was sort of you know a little bit scared of taking the jump but you just knew one of you had to or, well you yeah um, and it was definitely going to be an me easy decision? yeah it was definitely gonna yeah be um i yeah i was kind of getting to the end of enjoying my job um i wanted a new challenge for sure but then it was when we got the licenses, literally got them through, um, saying, yeah, you, you're allowed to do this, that I handed my notice in the next day. <laughs> and just oh. thought, there's my one one month notice. Uh, I guess I'll be starting a business after that. <laughs> That's a scary, no? Yeah, it, it was scary, but I think it was just ready at that point. We'd done, we'd done all the prep and we'd, we'd, we're so excited to get it out there that I was raring to go, really. So, 
didn't regret it <laughs> yeah and um i think you know when catherine was saying oh we knew it, we, it had to be one of us i think it was well, firstly catherine had always spoken about wanting to run a her own business and ultimately she's the one with all the business skills so she you know with a, a really good background in in retail working for some of the big sort of supermarkets and stuff like that in the head office in london and and actually has all of the you know in terms of like her skill set you know she's really really uh diligent and accurate and good at all of the admin and all of that sort of stuff whereas i'm a total nightmare with any of that kind of thing <laughs> but i'm not bad at kind of coming up with the ideas but there's no way that if i mean if i'd if i'd been the the person to hand my notice in it would have piled in pretty quickly i, I think so so um yeah i think it was it she's just the perfect person out of us two to to actually be the be the boss in that regard and actually do all of the really important stuff that needs to be done you know maybe the less sort of glamorous stuff the production side of it is it's not easy but that's the bit that you think of first you don't think of all of the procedural stuff all of the legislation all of the the day-to-day -day things that you have to get right for a business to work you know or the accounting everything like that you just you when you're when you're dreaming about starting a business you think about the product you think about you have these dreams about being in harvey nichols or harrods or wherever but you don't think oh, i'm gonna need to be all over my numbers all over mm. you know customer relations and stuff like that a lot of um, people just believe that they're gonna create this amazing product take it to the shop the shop's gonna love it they're gonna sell thousands of bottles to these yeah. customers who all love it and life's gonna be peachy and they don't think about the tiny little yeah, yeah it's a lot of work and there's a lot of small things that Catherine was definitely better prepared for um than than me i don't my experience is probably slightly different he's got access to the inbox which is uh has pro caused some issues just goes in there reads all the emails and then doesn't mark them as unread so then i'm just like <laughs> can't discover this email that i've never seen before <laughs> no but i think we're a good team in that sense because yeah harry is you know great at all the operations and the they come up with the idea and the creativity and the product development and that sort of thing and then i've kind of got to rein him in sometimes on some of the crazy ideas he's got but yeah we we worked together went well together on that that front it's quite funny because on the way here we were kind of discussing like questions that you might need to ask near the end <laughs> in case they cause a problem <laughs> <laughs> we can just leave. i think mean, this is the perfect just edit that bit this might be the perfect time <laughs> to uh, ask a bit of an awkward question okay what's it like working with your husband husband wife how's that go down it was quite good because we got five days off from each other each week <laughs> so harry goes back down to his job so um no it's been it has been good it's it has obviously had its its moments where you know we get into an argument about something small <laughs> or something big um but yeah i think in general like i was just saying you know we actually are quite a good team um we work well together when we've ever we had issues we've been come together as a team in a crisis what do you think <laughs> it's where it could go down yeah, <laughs> yeah com completely disagree because <laughs> like, we're working for a tyrant no it's um i think the thing that makes it that makes it work is that we've got a really clear distinction about wh who's responsible for what and that's you know it's also part of our character as well i don't think either of us would want to do the the jobs that the other one does mm. and and the the roles that we do have we, we both love so it's easy in that regard i think if we both had a similar um skill set and if we both had a similar sort of aspiration to you know i wanted to be the person who was dealing with all the customers and and doing all of the sort of important you know um business stuff as opposed to you know the 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 operations side of it moving stuff around building things creating the creating the the actual and production facility and things like that um i don't think either of us would want to do the other yeah. person's job so i think that's quite convenient and i think if it was the other way around it could be problematic definitely you could definitely put the threat in there well do you want to do it and if one's going to go no yeah. <laughs> definitely not i have always said though if harry was to to leave the army and come on full time i would have to sort of book in like a monthly disciplinary for him because he would do so many things that annoyed me that I'd have to 
<laughs> just be like, look, I'm the boss. No. <laughs> Maybe not so surprising, but I found it quite surprising. I'm sure I see a stat that businesses that are owned by a couple are two or three times more likely to succeed. I'm sure. Really? I've seen that. Yeah, I'm sure. I definitely seen Oh, wow. That. I bought as well. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I, I think I, I, I'd not heard that. I'm, uh, but actually thinking about it, it sort of makes sense because you have so much. I think when you work completely separately, you don't really know what your, your partner does on a day to day sort of basis. And so it's quite hard to have, you know, empathy with them. And so, you know, if they're staying late or, you know, stressing about something or you might just resent them for it and just go, well, you know, I've had a difficult day as well, like big, big deal. But because we're, because we're intimately involved in, in both aspects and, you know, Catherine's really good with, with the army as well. We can understand what the other person's feeling because we, we're read into the whole situation. Um, and I guess also the stakes are much bigger, aren't there? If, if you run a business together, you're, you're all in on that. You've and got so, to make it work. You've got yeah. to make it work. So, whereas I guess if you work separately, you always know if 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 one thing goes down, then you've got the other person to rely on. But if you're both in on it together, I can see you you just got to make it work, and uh, mm. and you can make time for that as well. Sorry, this is for Harry. I was just yeah. gonna. I was just wondering, is it hard when something goes wrong here and you're away somewhere? You know, with the army, like you, Catherine phones you up and says, "Oh my God, this has happened." <laughs> And then you've got it. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about it, and you're stuck maybe miles from home. Yeah, there is there is that, but um, I guess it, on the plus side, when you're away from it, you've got perspective, and so what what might seem like a disaster when you're right there dealing with it, actually, if you're a few hundred miles away or you're dealing with something else, you've got perspective on the situation, and you can go actually look. You know, it's not as bad as it seems, and then you've m- maybe far enough from, away from the problem to provide a solution. Mm. That you, if you were there, I'd probably just be getting in a flap, like you know, like you everybody else was. Yeah. So it's actually not. I think there's pl- there is definitely pluses and minuses, um, but yeah, I think in answer to your question, we're, there's been there's been times where I've wanted to sort of drop tools and 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 help out, but but most mostly it's been good though. Well, that's actually been really useful for me to have Harry be like that and have that perspective because certainly at the start when I I was actually living in Harry's parents' house for the first seven months, I was literally here all the time, so absorbed in it that it was very hard for me to get that perspective. And I did think, you know, anything that went wrong was an absolute nightmare and, you know, business wasn't going to work. We might as well give up now. (laughs) So just having Harry's like clarity on the phone and perspective to calm me down was really helpful. And I've actually learned a lot from him and his he's obviously dealt with a lot of stressful situations in his job. I now don't stress as much about the small stuff because, you know, you just kind of figure out actually, you know, unless the barn burns down again, <laughs> it can't be that bad. Yeah. Even then we've gone, come through it once before, you know, as a family, not seeing as us, but you know, seeing how his dad do that, you know, it's perspective is really important. And I think you can get too wrapped up in stuff if you're not careful. Do you find yourself kind of saying to yourselves often, like, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, I think we do a lot more now. Yeah. You know, you you, you develop more of a risk appetite because you think, you've gone, we've done this far, I've already done that. You know, that didn't work or this this has worked. So, you know, might as well give the next thing a shot. So, yeah. Kind of roll with the punches. I think that's what most kind of startups have to do, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I think fear of failure as well is much, it's going to be much more damaging than try, trying something, I think. Um, you know, you generally only regret stuff that you didn't do as opposed to stuff that you tried and maybe failed at. And so I think that's something we've definitely learned and, you know, we're much bolder in our decisions and confident that, you know, if something does go wrong, it's not the end of the world. We've got a good foundation, we've got a good product and we've had some amazing feedback and we know people like it. So that gives us confidence to kind of go forward and not be too scared to make make the occasional mistake, basically. How understanding is the army of your kind of side hustle? Well, I, I just don't, it just doesn't uh, affect my work. So yeah. I've never been in a situation where um, where I've had to give less than 100% with, with my job because of this. And that's mainly because Catherine takes, you know, ma- the majority of the burden and I only 
um, you know, help out at weekends or, you know, when I've got leave. So there's never really been a conflict. So there's never been any, there's never been any need for them to understand anything because it's not ever, it's not ever conflicted with what I need to do. So, um, and we sort of aim to keep it like that, don't we? So. Yeah, I just can say, I think Harry's underselling his contribution a bit. If you've ever seen any of the slightly um, more rogue Instagram posts, then that's Harry. <laughs> Obviously, he's built this, you know, he, he does. Yeah, but he, you're right. It doesn't it doesn't impact the army, but he does actually, actually contribute a huge amount. <laughs> inside a shepherd's hut. We never mentioned that. We're in a shepherd's hut. That Was it just chilling on the farm and you restored it or... It's yeah. impressive that it was put just the photos up with it. It's amazing. Thank you. It was. Just, it was. I mean, it's all Harry. I well, I've I've made that cushion cover that you're sitting on. That's my contribution. It's, it's a cracking cushion. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just a trailer chassis, wasn't it? That was sitting on the farm, and oh, there was no walls, nothing. No. No, no. There's there's um, nothing. It's literally um, uh, just a, a rusting trailer chassis that we that we had from from uh, all farms. have got a vehicle graveyard. <laughs> you go to go to any farm, you'd be able to find a vehicle graveyard somewhere. Um, and so, yeah, this has been the, the trailer had been here for a while. And uh, obviously, Catherine works in the same office as my dad. And we've got sort of two businesses working out of quite a small office. And it became quite quickly apparent that um, my dad's quite an eccentric bloke as well. Yeah, classical music. He likes to sing. So, Very lively. <laughs> so when uh, Catherine would have a meeting or something, you know, it'd be in a quite small office and my dad would come in wearing some ridiculous outfit, singing classical music very loudly, just completely oblivious to the other things that were going on. So it became quite apparent that we needed a bit more sort of working space, office space and, and somewhere to have meetings. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we built this and, uh, and it's come out really well, actually. So we, we built it from, again, from mostly materials that we had around. So the, the frame is made from trees that we felled from our one of our little woods we've got here and uh and it was actually it was just an awesome process and it sort of links into that same thing i was saying it's like a creative outlet um and it's just awesome to have that feedback like you work really hard on something and at the end of the day you've got something to to show for it and it's the sort of same thing comes from the rum and i think i think also that the, this whole process in terms of going back to the question you asked about um you know how, whether the army sort of how do they feel about it i just the thing that's made me realize is how much capacity people have in there to do stuff you think ah, oh, if i do one job you know then that's me me done but then there's so many you look around the world and then there's people I think rugby world cups on at the moment really good examples a guy called michael checker who's the australia uh rugby coach and so he's the coach of one of the best rugby teams in the world and you think I mean that must be a pretty hard full-time job but then he also runs a multi-million pound clothing business and he's got a property business and, and you look at these people and it's like where do they find the time and actually I think people massively underestimate what they're capable of and how much time you've got in the day uh, and if you can find something you're passionate about then you can you can dedicate time to it that you didn't even think you had um so yeah I guess that's and also, I managed to find time to build a shed as well. So, <laughs> on the subject of time, do you just get much time off for holidays or no? So, <laughs> what generally? Yeah, uh, you know, like most people are scared sometimes to start their own business. They think, I don't want my own business because I'll never be able to get away. I'll never be able to mm. go on holidays, especially here. Like you said, you used to live here. I'm not sure you still do. Yeah, no, it was just me. Here, you couldn't get away. So. Yeah, well, no, we have now. We now live in the next sort of village. Um, I think it was it was critical for the relationship of uh, <laughs> between myself and Harry's parents that we that we did that. Um, but yeah, I think the first year we didn't really take that much time off. You know, we were doing weekends. Um, you know, because obviously we don't see each other during the week. We'd then be doing stuff with the business at the weekend and. Um, you know we've seen a lot as friends we've tried to go to weddings but pretty much everything else was off the cards and then this year we sort of realized you know that isn't sustainable you have to take time off you have even if it's just a Sunday you have to have a day where you don't come here you don't you don't do anything to do with the business and you just try and 
leave that behind. So we've we've been better this year. We we did have a, a week in Scotland. <laughs> that was one, a holiday. Whole week. <laughs> whole week. Whole week off. <laughs> that must be quite hard to do. I know a lot of people talk about when they have their own business that they they spend their time off kind of thinking about oh, I could be doing this or this, I could be improving this part of the business. I could be d- doing a quick post or yeah, quite hard. I think because we did that in the first year and I got to the end of the first Christmas and uh, last Christmas and I was just exhausted. We realized actually we're, we're damaging the business because we're not taking that time off. We're not getting away from it and having that space to breathe. And actually doing that is helps the business. You know, you, you don't, you can't bring your best self in on Monday if you've left the office at 9 PM on Sunday. So we've trying to forced it and it's now becoming more of a habit that Sundays are hundred percent off. Sometimes Saturdays as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Day of rest. <laughs> Probably the last question now, it's the only one I've got, is um, how well does the, the rum go with food? Obviously the podcast is all about food so I'm, and drink, but I'll bring it back to food. Yeah, I'm, no. Yeah. I mean, we we absolutely love food. And like I said earlier, it was part of, you know, I love cooking and um, it was all part of the same process, all part of the same 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 aspects yeah, of that of that that as, that kind of um creative element um and the food and the rum goes really really well with with food especially the smoked rum so we love kind of american barbecue and and things like that and so you you know we've had a guy the what's the rugged chef the rugged chef he's a he's an instagram guy he's made a barbecue barbecue sauce with it and just using it in marinades uh works amazingly well um we have a shout out to Aaron Dishman who really rates our rum as a cooking rum uh <laughs> but when you pair it with foods as well it, it it can work amazingly um so the smoked rum with kind of any kind of meat so charcuterie or works really well with fish you know pair it with a kind of um cured fish like herring or um gravelax or smoked salmon it can work amazingly yeah and then and We've we've put we've made a lot of um like pancakes and crepes suzette and um cakes and things like that with a spiced. Um Harry's mum puts in a Christmas cake and yeah, it's really good for that. Yeah, I think it'd be good for soaking the raisins in and everything before you go. Definitely. Well we were actually at an event over the summer, uh, it was like an adventure race and we did um spiced rum flapjacks for the end of the race. So oh, wow. yeah, we we soaked the rums in, the raisins in the rum made flapjacks so everyone who'd come back you know covered in mud and water had a rum and raisin flapjack <laughs> yeah i can see it working well in a lot of puddings especially like an ice cream flavor if you can work that into the ice cream as well oh uh, yeah the honey rum and an ice cream would be incredible yeah, that'd be yeah great. my grandpa used to make a a honey ice cream because he was a beekeeper as well and uh i think that when I've not. We've not got an ice cream maker. We've got too many kitchen gadgets. Gadgets as it is. <laughs> Sounds like my kitchen. <laughs> but um, but I think when we do get an ice cream maker, that would be one of the first things. The honey, a honey rum ice cream would be uh, pretty deadly. I think. Yeah. Burning barn rum. People want to listen to this. They like the sound of it. Where can they go and get it from? So you can buy it on our website if you want to buy a bottle. Um, happy to give podcast listeners a fifteen percent discount. So if you want to put barn fifteen at the checkout, get fifteen percent off. Um, so you've, you've all three there and the gift set's on there as well. Brilliant. Um, locally in Birmingham, we're in Connolly's, um, we're in all the farm shops around here, um, Drinks Emporium, places like that. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to find us if you look for us. Well, what's the website? Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's an obvious one, isn't it? <laughs> www.burningbarnrum.com. We'll yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty. We'll put all the links up but that's... Yeah. And then we're all, we're just at Burning Barn Rum for all our socials and stuff like that. So give us a follow. Well, thanks very much for that. Absolutely, it was, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah, really, especially the tasting. <laughs> yeah. the tasting is good. Did yeah, that off, off air. <laughs> thanks so much for having us. Thanks yeah, for coming it's been out. Absolutely awesome. I think your story is brilliant. I think you two make just yeah. <laughs> I can just see it doing really well. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll keep keep tracking our keep tracking our progress and and thanks for doing the podcast and letting us all know about the good stuff you can find around Brum. So cheers. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.